Tonight, I'd like to uh, speak about something good that came out of COVID, if that's possible. Back in the spring, when the whole world was shut down and we had to stop our school, and I couldn't even figure out what I could plan to do the next day. I was waiting for the governor to tell me if I had to tie my shoes or wear the Velcro shoes or didn't know what to do. Um, Pastor Dameron preached a message, and I don't remember the whole point of the message, uh, but he, he, he talked about the children of Israel and God leaving the, some other nations in the, in the land to, to prove them. And so it struck me to, what does that mean? So I started looking up the word prove and the, the words behind it. And so I just started studying out that word and other words similar to it. And um, this is the result. I really have enjoyed it. Um, I'm afraid it might be a little academic, which is code for dry and boring, um, but I didn't think so. So we will see here. I titled this one, God Gives a Test. Um, there were three words that I looked at that are translated prove or tempted or tried, those, those types of things in the Old Testament. Each of them have slightly different meanings. <clears throat> the first one here is the word that, uh, that we're going to actually look at tonight is a test, and as far as I can understand, much like a teacher would give a test at school. Uh, we, we have students that took tests today. Some of them claimed that there was material on the test that the teacher didn't teach. That never happens. Um, but just a, a test, <clears throat> not, um, well, I'll get to the next words. Uh, here's some places where this is used in this sense. Um, and David girded his sword upon his armor and essayed to go, for he had not proved it when David was going to fight Goliath with, with uh, Saul's armor. Um, Genesis 22, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said to him, behold, uh, said to Abraham, and, and he said, behold, here am I. There, tempt is that same word. God was testing Abraham. Um, 1 Kings 10, when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. And they're literally a test um, that she was giving him. <clears throat> Daniel 1, 12, where the Hebrew children didn't want to eat the, the king's food, said, prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink there. So a, a test, just a, a test like a teacher would give is the way I envision that word. There's another word that can be uh, translated into some of these same types of words in English, and it means it comes from, um, from metallurgy and that type of thing, and it has the idea of refining something. It can be translated as tried or even goldsmith. Uh, that word comes back to this one, uh, to purge, those types of things. Let me give just one example uh, from Second Samuel, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. It's not that somebody made a test up and had the Bible answer it. It's that it's, it's refined, it's pure. That's the idea behind that one. The third word um, can also be translated test, uh, but it has more the idea of investigating something, trying to find out what it's like. It also comes uh, from uh, metallurgy and working with metal, um, in my mind, I thought maybe like a blacksmith who makes something is wanting to, to examine and see how strong it is. He knows it's strong, but wanting to figure out the strength of this thing. That, that type of, or the idea of an examination, examining something, uh, like investigating something, I'm sorry, is a better word, investigating what something is like. Uh, one place where this is used, uh, Job 23, uh, he know, uh, but he knoweth the way that I take, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. That is examining him. So, so anyway, there's these three words uh, that I looked at. There are a couple places where they all show up together, some of them together in the same word, and I thought these were um, at least interesting. Psalm 26.2 has all three in it. It says, examine me. That was the third of the words. Exa investigate me, O Lord, and prove me. That's the give me a test. And try my reins in my heart. That's the, the purify me, purge me, that, that type of uh, thing. So all three of them used there in that same sentence. Um, anyway, the, 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 those are the things I investigated, I guess you'd say. And the word I want to focus on tonight is that first one, the word that's just a test, like a teacher would give a test. And we'll look, look at some places 
where the Bible refers to God giving somebody a test and uses this word behind it, just a simple test. So let's pray, and we've got a couple of opening thoughts, and we'll look at a couple of examples where this is used. So, Lord, we ask that you'd help us as we look in your word. Lord, we ask that this would uh, be a challenge, as it was to me, uh, about this test uh, that is coming for us, that we'd be ready for it. Lord, we do thank you for your word and for our school and for this church and the freedom we have to meet. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, some opening thoughts. <clears throat> uh, the first uh, opening thoughts. Uh, the first one is that God is going to give us a test, and we should prepare for them. All right. Uh, the, really, the, the, the thought that struck me the most out of this study uh, it would take about 30 seconds, but I've got to expand this. So I, here's the thought, and then we'll, we'll expand it. But the whole thought was that the test, the, the preparation comes before the test. Right? There are times in the Bible where God talks about putting us in a situation to, to, so we learn from it. But these words, it's a test. You would, you would get mad at your student if they went to math class and said, man, I can't wait to figure out what I'm going to learn on the test. You say, wait a second, you're supposed to learn that ahead of time. The test is a reflection of how well you prepared. And that thought is what really hit me. Am I preparing now for this test? Or am I just sitting back saying, God, go ahead and put me in situations so that I learn? Or is it, I'm going to prepare now. I'm going to, uh, we could list off all the things we know we should be doing, but we should be, pre be preparing for this test. So uh, the Bible does talk about God putting us in a position to force us to learn and to purge and clean us. I'm not saying that thought isn't valid as well, but this thought is there's a test coming. We should prepare for it. And I think if uh, we could all easily make a list of the types of things that we should be doing to prepare for this test. So, all right, second opening thought here is that uh, the test is not designed to teach us, but to reveal what we've learned, or apparently today for some students, reveal what they didn't learn. All right, it's to point out those holes. God is wanting to see. Now, he's omnipotent. He knows the answer, but uh, he's wanting us to see what we know and we don't know, how we, respond, how we respond to these tests. All right, a, a third opening thought is the test is for our own good. All right, uh, students often struggle with that thought that you mean this isn't because you hate me? All right, no, this is for your own good. Um, we'll look at this verse later, but Deuteronomy 8.16 says, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee, that word, and to do thee good at thy latter end. The test was designed to produce good in our life. Sometimes the issue is our idea of good and God's idea of good are different, all right? And we need to accept God's idea of good, but it's for our good. So, all right, some opening thoughts. And we're going to look at some particular examples where God says he gave the children of Israel or somebody a test and uh, try to learn some things from that. We're going to see God testing several different characteristics. And I'm just going to list, list them for us here and then we'll look at them. Uh, some of them is just to test us to see if we'll obey. Just simple obedience, keep his commandments. Sometimes it's if we'll fear God. Sometimes it's if we love God. Another time we'll see it's if we diligently Hearken. So these tests, God says he was there to prove them, and then there's some place in the passage, there's an indication of, of what God was testing. This is what I want to see. If they're going to do this, this test is aimed at this thing right here. I'm going to see how they respond. So, All right, the first area is in Exodus 16, uh, verses 3 and 4. This is when God uh, sent manna to the children of Israel. And I'll just read a couple of verses there. Exodus 16, 3 and 4. And the children of Israel said unto them, uh, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Uh, then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall not go out, I mean, the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them, that, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or no. So here this manna was given, and part of this was a test to see if they were going to walk in God's law. With the particular manna, I mean, with this manna, God gave some rules and instructions about it. 
Uh, if you're familiar with it, they're, uh, you know, only get enough for that day. Don't save it for the next day. And uh, before the Sabbath day, get twice as much. And uh, it, because it's not coming on the Sabbath day, there were some instructions. And we can probably all think back to times where the children of Israel failed that test. They didn't follow God's command. Um, we won't read that, but later on in that same chapter, it, uh, there's some guys who uh, didn't listen about the command to uh, get double before the Sabbath day because there's no manna coming. They, they went out on the Sabbath day, and they're looking around, and there's nothing. Right? They, they failed. They didn't obey. A simple, direct command of God, they didn't obey it. Right? Um, running ahead, uh, if we look in Numbers chapter 11, or at least running uh, ahead in the Bible, we can see God's not happy with them when they failed. Numbers 11, verse 6, says there, But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. Uh, it's kind of amazing that, you know, every day you walk out and there's food on the ground for you, and they got sick of it at some point there. It's... it's there's a lot of lessons here for us about uh, being satisfied with God's provision. But they got sick of it. Uh, then down to verse 33 at the end, it says, and while the, I'm sorry, I should back up. In the interim there, God sends the quail to them, and they go out and gather all the quail. And then verse 33, and while the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed, the wrath of God was kindled against the people, and the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. So here they, they failed the test. And it did not make God happy. All right, we can probably all think of a, a teacher uh, who was not very pleased uh, with a test result. They walk in and everybody's failed the test. Now, the students are always thinking, this is the teacher's fault. Obviously, they did a bad job. All right, with God, that's never going to be the case. All right, when we fail the test, it's going to be our fault. And here the test is just simple obedience. And they, they did not obey. It's easy to think of a child, you know, Caitlin Bishop, um, she had to come see me today. Um, <laughs> Caitlin Bishop just needs to obey. Right? But we need to just obey. All right? Think of, you could probably not without too much trouble, think of some times where there was a financial decision, tithing, an offering, and it boiled down to, am I going to obey God or am I going to do what I want? Just obedience. Or maybe witnessing to somebody. You know, you hear that, that, that prod, you hear the prod, you feel the prod in your heart to go witness to somebody, and it boils down to, am I going to obey? And it's real easy to look at a child and say, yeah, bad. Right? But for us, do we obey? That was a simple test here. Are they going to keep God's law or not? And uh, God's not any more happy with us than he was with them uh, when we disobey. All right, so manna, that's one place there. God says there's the test, and he tells us this was to see if they're going to obey. All right, let's look at another passage, Exodus 20. If you're familiar with uh, this, this chapter at all, this is where the Ten Commandments are um, given to us in the verses before this. We'll read down to verse 20, Exodus 20, 20. This is after the Ten Commandments are given, the last ones in verse 17. Uh, verse 18, it says, And the people saw the thunderings and the lightning and the noise of the trumpet and the mountains smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And then verse 20, And Moses said to the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, test you, that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. So again, this is, you know, there's a connection with just obedience. But here God specifically says it was to see if we're going to fear him. Do we fear God? Sometimes we, um, there's legitimate thoughts of this. We, we over-spiritualize that. But I think some of us just, we should be scared. I mean, they just saw this mountain shaking and the lightnings and the smoke. God is powerful. And uh, that should give us a little bit of pause there as, as we're thinking about going our own way or, or not keeping the Ten Commandments that he had just given out there. Uh, wait a second. The, 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 the God who gave us those, he's the one that made that whole mountain shake. Uh, I don't want to mess with him. We should fear God. And that was the test. We will respond to the thing we fear the most. 
Right? If, if there's a choice in life and you know, one side you're obeying because you fear God and the other side is disobedience and you're fearful of what people think or fearful of the consequences of obeying God or whatever it is, if we choose this thing, then we're fearing that and not fearing God. Right? I remember as a child, um, everything gets bigger in your mind from when you were a child, but I had to walk home from school up this hill. It was great to sled down. We weren't supposed to do that, and I failed that test as well. Because uh, at the bottom was this road, and it just went straight to the road. It's great fun. Um, but anyway, we had to walk up this hill, um, and there was this dog. And in my eye, you know, as a kid, this dog was about this tall, and a head as big as the pulpit, and he wanted to eat me. And it was, he was going to kill me. Uh, and so every day, this wasn't every day, but in my memory, this is the way it seems like, every day I'm dropped off at the bottom of that hill and I have this, you know, couple hundred yard walk up to my house, and I'm just petrified. I'm, you know, back and forth the whole way, fearful of the dog. Every action I took was affected by that dog, or my fear of that dog. Now, I don't ever actually have to run from it or anything, but I was petrified of it. Now, maybe we shouldn't be petrified of God, but just like that dog affected everything I did as I went home. Are there parts of our life that we don't let God affect? I mean, that, that fear, we should, God, God has an opinion. How dare us not take his opinion about something? Right? So do we fear him? So the Ten Commandments, God says the test was to see if we fear him. Right? Let's turn over to Deuteronomy 8. Eight verse two. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness, the wandering, to humble thee and to prove thee. Test that same word, and to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. So again, we have another test, and it was to see if we we're going to obey, keep his commandments. Or not, right? Makes me think that maybe we're a little slow with the obedience, or at least I am. I uh, also thought it was interesting there, it talks about humbling. He hath, and he humbled thee. I'm sorry, I read the verse wrong. To humble thee and to prove thee. All right? Uh, I don't think it's an accident that humble and obedience are connected here in this same verse in this test. Um, it's real easy, at least for us guys, to think we're more important than we are. And guys, if you don't think that, talk to your wife, and uh, they'll, they'll let you know. It's real easy for us to get proud. Right? We're, we're nothing. And uh, that pride is sometimes what causes us not to fear God and causes us to not obey God. We, we want our way more than we want God's way. So the wilderness wanderings, another test there. The obedience and humility both brought up in that one. Let's turn to Deuteronomy 13, just a couple pages. We can see another test that I thought was interesting. Deuteronomy 13, we'll read verses 1 through 3. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and give thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign of the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake, spoke unto thee, saying, Let us go after, um, did I read that wrong? Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Then thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or of that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you, testeth you, to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So again there, God's saying the test. It's going to be a false prophet. You hear what he's saying? Are you going to follow it? I had to think about this a little bit to, to, to give something at least for me to chew on here. Well, the thought that came to me, well, I mean, obviously that we should love God, but that we should, we've got to love the God of the Bible. We can't, we can't make up in our mind, I think God should be this way and love that. Right. We've got to love the God of the Bible. And if we hear somebody bring in some false idea that's not in the Bible, we've got to reject it because we love the God of the Bible. Right? He's testing us to see if we love him with that false prophet. All right, uh, Judges, chapter 2. I 
I didn't write down the passage that got me thinking along this line, but I believe this was the passage, um, if I remember correctly. Judges 2, uh, verses 21, 22. I also will not henceforth drive out uh, any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died, that, the, that through them I may prove Israel, whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. All right, so here, the, the, uh, the nations that were left, God was saying, I'm going to leave some of them there because I want that to be a test. As future generations come, uh, there will be that test to see whether or not they're going to obey or are they going to get pulled away. There's a couple of thoughts I had about this one. Um, but the, the, the main thought was, it seems to me like this would be a constant exposure to the world and to, to non-biblical ideas. Are we going to continue to resist that? It's real easy to start having the world's thoughts and dress and behavior and emotions and other things. We've got to fight that. And it's going to be a constant fight because we live in the world. I mean, we're here. Uh, and we've got to fight it. Just like they lived in the land and these other nations were there. And they were constantly exposed to their gods, their way of life, the way they spoke. And they had to fight it. This test was to see whether they would hold the line. Um, this test also, other places, talks about the, the children of Israel failing to drive them out. So there's an idea here. This is also something that, that God let them make for themselves. They, they made their bed here, and God said, I'm going to let you lay in it um, and let this be the test to see whether or not we're going to obey or not. And we know if you've read the book of Judges at all, they, they fail and they fail and they fail as they let these other nations uh, influence the way they thought and acted and lived. Um, it's also in this passage where it says that this was for their good. All right, that God, um, I won't read it in Exodus 23. It talks about how God didn't want to drive them all out because then the land would become desolate. Just, you know, imagine... Uh, a house and a land that's been vacant for uh, you know a couple of decades, and then you come and try to occupy it. God was saying, this test there, there's going to be some good out of it. When you when you when you obey, when you pass this test and you drive the people out like you're supposed to, you're going to walk into maintained properties, not abandoned wilderness. So the test there. It's for our good. Sometimes we can get really bent out of shape at the test and get mad at God, but it's for our good if we bother to try to pass the test. So, there's a couple other spots we can look, but I think we get the point there, this test that's coming. We need to prepare now for it. Before we end here, I have a couple of other points I'd like to think about as I looked up this word and places it's used, some other things that struck me. The first one is that we are not to test God. He directly says that we should not prove God. Um, Deuteronomy 6, 16, you shall not tempt that same word, the Lord your God, as you tempted him in Massa. Um, Exodus 17 gives the same day in Psalm 78, other places. Our job isn't to tempt God. We shouldn't go to God and say, all right, let's see what you've learned. Talk about a proud thought, all right? It's, it's God who gives us the test, not us that test God. Um, Psalm 78, let's flip there quickly, brought out an interesting thought that the opposite of testing God, giving this God this test, is believing and trusting. 78, we'll drop down to verse 18. Uh, yea, they spoke against God. They said, can God furnish us a table in a wilderness? Behold, he smote the rock that the water gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? You can see the, the testing. Uh, therefore the Lord uh, heard this and was wroth, so a fire was kindled against Jacob, uh, and the anger and anger also came up against Israel because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. So they were, they were peppering God with these tests because they didn't trust God. They didn't believe God. Now, teachers, 
uh, hopefully none of my teachers think this way. They don't uh, just take it on faith that the students got it. You know, in, in Algebra 2, we have a lesson and we cover something. And sorry, don't worry about the homework. I know you got it. And don't worry about the test. I'm going to take it on faith. All right, that's, we wouldn't do that in a classroom. But God's saying we're not supposed to give him a test. We're supposed to have faith. We don't have to test God. We can trust him. We can believe him. All right, so the opposite there of testing God is believing and trusting. All right, if you are um, thinking ahead, the third point here, you might think of this verse in Malachi where it seems like there's a contradiction. Malachi 3.10, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. So is God saying don't test him, but test him? No, that's a different word. That was the investigate word. Like, see how wonderful it is. You get a, you get a present given to you, uh, and you're thinking, this is going to be great. Let's open it up and see what's there. That's the idea. It's not a test like a teacher would give. This is investigate to see how great God is there. So when he says to prove it, we are supposed to investigate and, and glory in what God is, but not to give him a test. All right, one more uh, thought here before we close is that God tells us we should ask God to test us. Psalm 26.2, examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins in my heart. This is something we should ask God for. God, test me. I want to know where I'm failing. That's a hard thing to ask for. All right? Um, not many students go to their teachers and say, please give me a really, really hard test because I want to know where I messed up or where I'm confused. But that should be our thought with God. God, test me. I want to see where I'm going to fail, where I can improve on. Testing. Again, the, the, the main thought from the beginning was the tests are coming, we should prepare. Just like a child at school, if they're wise, will prepare for the test. They don't walk into the spelling test excited about learning how to spell the words, I hope. All right? They walk into the spelling test having learned how to spell the words and want to demonstrate that here. And in our Christian life, there are tests coming. Are we preparing? Or are we like a child that, that doesn't do his homework and just flounders at school. We should be consistently walking with God, studying, obeying, loving God, fearing God. Are we practicing those things that we know are right, right now, to prepare us for those tests that we know are coming? We know they're coming. Let's have every head bowed and eye closed while we pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and how we can learn from it and Lord, this simple thought about tests. We know they're coming. Lord, help us to prepare. Lord, you, you don't make it confusing about the things you want us to do. Help us to be diligent and busy. And then, Lord, when that test comes, Lord, we ask that you'd help us to pass. Lord, we do again thank you for your word and how we can learn from it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.